Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of the Sam's Report. I'm your host, as the title says, Brad Sams. And uh what is today? Today is November 18th, the last oh buddy, the last Friday. The last Friday before uh Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving in the US, that is. If you're a Canadian, I know you've already had your Thanksgiving, but we Americans celebrated in November, and it is next Thursday, which will create um uh, a little bit of issues with the show because my wife will probably shoot me if I do a podcast on next Friday. Um, but I'll probably still do one next week, maybe next Wednesday. We were talking before the show started, maybe next week, because I know it's gonna be slower. There's also gonna be fewer days. Um, I mean, who's going to drop some big news, anything on a Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday before a holiday uh, to really talk about actually what I use. I've never really done an episode like that. I've talked about it here and there, but uh, yeah, so let's just maybe run with that. That sounds like a decent idea. So anyways, um, some Throat.com updates. Some people always ask. It happens every week, and it always... Uh, <laughs> It always kind of baffles me that people don't actually know who Paul Thorat is. And so if you're watching this podcast and you've ever actually seen anything I've written, um, interesting scenario, but I, I know it happens because it, there's comments on YouTube every week and I get uh, messages on Twitter sometimes, which is interesting. But anyways, uh, so I write uh, a lot frequently, several posts a week, sometimes several posts a day. Um, if it's enterprise business related, it's going to be on Petri.com. That's P-E-T-R-I.com. And if it's consumer related, uh, we have another product property called Throt, T-H-U-R-R-O-T-T.com. And that is the consumer channel of the company. And so the holding or the kind of parent company is a company called Blue Whale Web uh, media group, which I am the executive editor of that company, which oversees those two properties. Um, so hopefully that kind of clears, clarifies how this whole thing works. But I uh, actually had quite a few questions about that. So one of the things that is now on Throat.com, many people have been asking for is a monthly subscription. Uh, if you don't want to pay for the annualized subscription, you can now do so on a month to month basis. And there you go. Kumbaya. Um, I, I don't know what else to tell you, but we've now that feature is now live. So there you go. Uh, also this week, if you watched What the Tech with Andrew Zarian, Andrew is actually a pretty good friend now. I, would, I think it's fair to say he's a good friend now. Um, he does the production for First Ring Daily that I do with Paul every day. And he has a podcast called What the Tech. Um, it's been around for quite a while. And so I was co-hosting that with him this week. So you can go check that out as well. And I say we dive in to what happened in the world of Microsoft this week. This is a much more Microsoft one. Sometimes we get a little off kilter with uh, Apple and Google, but this one is, this one's pretty Microsoft focused. Uh, so things that have been announced, um, now anyone can use Skype. So that headline that people were, were saying, um, depending on the website you went to, was a little interesting. They're saying now anyone can use Skype. Well, anyone could always use Skype. What it means is that now anyone can use it with a guest account. So you can now host uh, Skype chat rooms through a website and yeah, there you go. So you can use it as a guest account. Actually, Tom Warren of The Verge, another good friend, uh, we wanted to see if we could get a chat room up to 300 because at some point, somewhere along the way, Microsoft said these chat rooms supported 300 and we really wanted to see that if that what happened when user 301 joined in. And so actually he got up to 302. I think the 300 number is just an arbitrary thing. Maybe they can only guarantee performance up to 300, but we had 302 people in there and I pieced out. Um, and it, it still worked just fine. So... There you go. Uh, other fun headlines of the week. <laughs> I can't really believe this came a thing. Actually, Paul ended up writing up too because we had a very good laugh over it. It's uh, Microsoft said, hey, Project Scorpio, which is, for those not familiar, is Microsoft's next generation Xbox console that's going to come in roughly a year from now. They announced it at E3 earlier this year. and It'll support 4K gaming, um, VR, all kind of crazy stuff. Uh, they said, hey, it's going to be exp more expensive than the Xbox One S. Obviously. I there's no way they're going to come out with a super high-end console and it's going to be priced less than their new streamlined Xbox One S. It's not going to happen. So it's going to be a premium product. I honestly think it's going to be like, I think $499, uh, $399 or $499 is going to be the price point. Maybe maybe even $450. Remember, it's going to be super high-end. They're not holding anything back. Microsoft, they tried to play that up in their videos that's saying, hey, this is not... This is not your average console. We are pushing everything as high as we can. And granted, that someone's going to say, well, they claim that every time. Yes, I do agree. But this is a, a shorter life cycle product release from we looked at when the Xbox One came out uh, to the Scorpio. 
So shorter time span, uh, it's going to be all backwards and forwards compatible. And so really they're just adopting the PC model. Somebody actually asked, and might, maybe this is the questions and we'll kind of jump into it. Is the Xbox Scorpio just going to be a PC? Grant, granted, these things already are just PCs. Um, the chip inside might not always be x86, but remember this thing is running Windows. The Xbox runs Windows. It is a PC by all accounts. Um, granted, you may not be able to run a get to the start menu although i guarantee i bet you probably could I, I bet that when they were building this all up that they had actual windows itself running on the xbox one s but it's just a pc with a very narrow focus and so i is the xbox scorpio pc yeah um here's what i honestly hope and this is this is what i think microsoft needs to do so they've been pushing this cross play functionality right you buy it once or you can you buy it once uh, play anywhere that's a different thing i know um they've been pushing that but they've been also play, pushing cross play with some games where you can be on a pc and play with a console <laughs> what i hope and i don't know how i know there's going to be um, there's going to be some issues with this but this is what i hope this is kind of the dream for me is that when you buy a digital game through the microsoft store because that's what you're buying when you buy it through the console and i keep pointing to that screen because that's where i play xbox um actually the console is right here I'll grab the I use an Elite controller, which this thing is fabulous. Although mine's a little bit worn out, which is surprising. Um, I might have to buy another one. So, Xbox controller here. But what I honestly hope is that they make the new games just UWPs or Windows Store games. So that when you buy it once, it's truly the same game. It, developers would love this too. Imagine you go to the Windows Store and you download Call of Duty on your PC and it's the exact same thing on the Xbox. Granted, they might have to do some sort of API calls or something on the back end uh, because so it can be more optimized because that's the benefit of a console, remember, is that it's a very streamlined production product that is highly tuned for gaming. Uh, it, well, it is now. It was for TV and other media stuff that Microsoft screwed up. But that is my dream. Is And hopefully that's where Microsoft's going, is that it's one game package that you buy and it just runs on everything that supports it. So it'll be interesting to see how they do that. That thought has to have come up inside the world of Microsoft, at least I hope. Um, if not, I will happily go up there and sit in a lawn chair with a megaphone and say, hey guys, let's get to this type of a future. And the benefit that has is really simple. One, you're going to get faster game development from uh, studios. And so that gives Microsoft a big advantage because then it's, hey, you buy the game on there and look, it just runs on your PC provided it meets minimum specs. Um... And there you go. So that'll be interesting. I, I, I don't quite know their full agenda yet. All they've said is that it's backwards and forwards compatible. So anything you buy today will work on the Scorpio. And we will learn more, I guarantee, next year uh, at E3. And so that's probably where they'll, they'll kind of do the big kit and caboodle release of the Scorpio. Or at least start the drip stream of things that are going on. So there you go. Uh, that console will cost more. And that, if you're surprised by that, I'm, you shouldn't be. You really should not be surprised by that. Uh, other things announced this week. Windows 10 build, a new build of Windows 10. And there's a couple small things here. Um, we got, if you use eBooks, um, specifically the EPUB book format, Edge can now open those files natively, as long as there's no protection uh, on that. And it works just like a PDF. You can open those in Edge. I know, crazy feature. Uh, PowerShell. PowerShell. I'm sure a lot of people in here use PowerShell. I, I jest, but actually quite a few people do use PowerShell. PowerShell is now the default command prompt for File Explorer. It used to be command.exe or command prompt as most people know it. They have replaced that with PowerShell. And one of the other things, and this isn't directly related, but it's definitely ties in. And so if you jump back uh, a couple weeks ago, there was this rumor or sketch up or mockups, I can't exactly remember, of an Office Hub coming to Windows 10. And so the Git Office app, which was really just an advertisement in Windows, is being updated. They're, they're actually going to make it functional. And it's turning into this kind of like Office 365 hub. And it's really great. Uh, you can, If you're on an insider program, you can go download it now. Just fire up the Windows Store and check for updates and it'll download it. And all it does is it brings all your Office 365 management and documents and everything into one little one little app. It's great. And so you can, you can look at your subscription, figure out when it's going to renew. You can manage your installations. You can download all the apps, which is probably the biggest thing for me because every time I get a new machine up, it's, it's like, uh, where do I go to download this stuff? So you go to Bing or Google or whatever, it's the Office 365 downloads. You go to the website, you log in, then you have to navigate to the spot to download the apps. 
and then there you go. But now with Windows 10 and this new app, all you do is just you just type Office and it pulls it up and you can just go bing, 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 get all your apps. Uh, all your recent documents are there and it's good. So uh, check for that. It's, it's one of these updates. It's like, why did this take so long? Why did this take so long, Microsoft? But you know what? It's uh, it's there. So, kumbaya. Uh, yes, as somebody pointed out this week, um, I am using a real glass. Actually, my wife, bless her heart, went out and bought some new glasses. And she said, hey, this type of a glass would be great for your scotch. And I, I agreed. And so, there's water in here today. Uh, this evening, there will probably not be water in there. Uh, if there is water, that's a problem. So, anyways, yes, real glass today. No... No kids' glass, although uh, I can't rule it out that those will not happen again in the future. Um, other things that happened this week. So, Surface Studio review embargo broke. Unfortunately, I did not get a Surface Studio. I should say, not not a Surface Studio yet. Actually, Microsoft warned me about this. Uh, well, my performance base is upstairs. They said, hey, we're gonna the performance-based studio or Surface books are going to be plentiful. Uh, Surface Studios are in extreme limited production and review units were slim and whatever and blah 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 i didn't get one i always hate that but microsoft has said hey we are going to send you one um just once we get one and really the reviews are exactly what i expected they to be from when i got to play with them in new york uh super high-end display it's great on last year's technology right they have um an older older graphics chip in there they have uh a, a spinny platter drive it's a hybrid drive or whatever apple calls a fusion drive you know solid state married to a platter drive and it's it's yesterday's infrastructure with tomorrow's display so there you go uh it to somebody asked how well it would run autocad i would imagine it runs exceptionally well i mean don't get me wrong it's still a 980m chip the mobile chip it, it yes it is older it's not the new pascal stuff but it's not a slouch either and it's still running Skylake, which that shouldn't come as a big surprise because, uh, yeah, Skylake is what it is. Uh, the next-gen chips, I don't even know if you can get them yet, especially considering everything else in there. And the split, spinny platter drive, as I like to call them, is going to be the, the bottleneck, but there is some solid-state infrastructure in there to make it faster. I do, do wish that it did have a solid, uh, a, a full solid-state or like an M2 drive. That would really make up for it. Uh, other things are the ports are all on the back. So Microsoft did very much put uh, form over function. So if you're trying to put an SD card in the back, it is a little bit awkward and all the ports are on the back, just like a Mac. Uh, although on Mac, actually, I don't know where the new SD card slot, the old one is, used to be in the side. Um, I haven't bought an iMac in extremely long time. But the review is exactly what I expected. The reviews are exactly what I expected them to be. Really expensive, amazing display, and kind of older older inf you know older kind of technology bits inside so we'll see how well they sell i mean they're already kind of pushed back um on the back orders and all that good stuff and but that's again not surprising microsoft at every every point along the way they they said limited production um small quantities and it's going to be hard to find initially microsoft said this multiple times they said it in emails they said it at the events they said it to me privately they said it to me pub publicly they said it to me in email when i asked about review units and they said hey we'll get you one but they're just limited supply and i get it totally understand and so eventually that machine will come around and it'll be a great day oh so that's the surface studios you can go check it out uh, i'd be real curious if anybody ordered one um let me know i i really want to know when you get it and actually on what your honest opinion is of it uh if you're spending three grand on a machine at least three grand it, that's the starting price is that it's got to be perfect in every way and so microsoft doesn't have the best track record of first generation hardware being flawless so i'm going to be very curious to see how these machines kind of materialize for people so if you got one, let me know. There you go. Uh, Cortana now has new capabilities. Cortana now has to be able to keep track of your to-do list. This is one of those things. It's like, really, guys? It took this long? But yeah, Cortana has to-do list, which leads me to my next point. So I wrote an article this week, and this is going to be a little bit just, to me, like how things, my work process is generally this. Um, I either tweet something or just start talking about it publicly. 
then it goes to a podcast and I talk about it on the podcast because I, you guys listening today give honestly give great feedback. I, I really do. When I say something and you guys respond with a genuine comment, I really do read these things. And um, if you ever look at how much I respond to everybody, I, I really do pay attention. So the work process is it starts maybe a Twitter tweet. Sometimes it starts on the podcast and I talk about a topic and I get some feedback. And then the end of the life cycle for me is when the post goes out because that's the culmination of everything. And so this week, I finally wrote up, uh, the future of Cortana is cloudy. And what I mean by that is Microsoft lacks meaningful endpoints with Cortana. And someone's going to say, what do you mean, Brad? Because it's on iOS, it's on Android, it's on Windows Phone, it's on the PC, and it's even on the Xbox. Those are all endpoints. Yeah, but none of them are meaningful, though. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. If you're on iOS, to use Cortana, you have to sidestep Siri, right? You have to actually open up the app. Uh, you can't reprogram your iPhone to use Cortana natively. So it's a second-class citizen. On Android, you have to download the app. Granted, I think there are some phones that Microsoft may have uh, positioned Cortana to ship with, I think with Cyanogen maybe, uh, where Cortana is native. But for the vast majority of the billion phones out there or billion active users of Android, it's Google Now or Google Assistant. So Android isn't really a great one. Windows Phone, yes, it is the native client for Cortana uh, as the AI assistant, but Windows Phone is at 1% or 1% or less, depending on where you're, you're living. And so that takes out the three mobile things. And on the desktop, I actually read a poll this week on Twitter. Granted, I know this is not the most scientific uh, poll, but I asked how many people... Um, how many people talk to their PC? Not just use Cortana, because I'll get to that in a second, but physically or actually talk to it. And it was, I, I want to say around 60% said never. They never talked to their PC. And then it was a, a, another large chunk, chunk said very infrequently. And there was around 8 or 9% that said frequently. So less than 10% of the people on a PC are talking to it. So again, that's not a really meaningful use case. And people are going to say, well, Brad, I hit the Windows key and I type. And technically that is a Cortana interaction. I I totally get that. That is considered using Cortana, but it's not the same, right? Because you could do that on uh, Windows 7. You could do that on Windows 8. Really what that is, is that's just a search with Cortana overlaid. And so don't get me wrong. Cortana is not a bad platform. That's what people have misunderstood about this. Cortana is fine. It does a lot of great things. It got to-do list finally, but I mean, it, it does good voice dictation. It understands what you're asking. It can do a lot of things. The problem is the utilization rate of Cortana compared to say Siri, or I don't want to say um, the Amazon Echo. If I say that, well, if I say Alexa, oh, didn't it? Hey Alexa. Oh, it's unplugged. <laughs> I I forgot. Uh, I unplugged it before the show for that exact reason. And so you've got the Echo, and then you've got Google. And those are all meaningful endpoints, but Microsoft really lacks that. And it, this is a problem because if people don't understand how to use Cortana or know the brand name, they're just going to start Siri, um, the Echo. Uh, it, it, they're all going to become the household brands. So Microsoft is missing. And what I want Microsoft to do is to build a freaking Cortana cube. It is a standalone headless PC. And I've talked about this a million times that just runs Cortana and I can put it in my kitchen and it'll sync to everything. Cause again, Microsoft has the best ecosystem when it comes to the AI, because if you have a Cortana cube, it syncs to your desktop, it syncs to your phone, it syncs to fricking every, it syncs to your Xbox, but it's missing that voice component. And I would happily buy these things and put them all over my house so that I can have a, a functioning AI assistant that is on everything. Because right now, if I use the Echo, it's only on the Echo. Granted, you can use some things and get it onto other parts, but not natively, and it's not straightforward. If I use Siri, it's only on my phone. It's not on my desktop. It's not on my Xbox. It's not on where I need it to be. And if I use Cortana, it's a second-class experience because it's not the native way of using it on my phone. So, Microsoft, and, and here's... Here's my concern. If Microsoft doesn't do this quickly, they're going to they're gonna fall behind very fast. Uh, Alexa has a lot of skills. Um, I wasn't able to understand the question I heard. <laughs> I flicked it back on. So there's actually a switch underneath my foot that turns that power strip on and off. So I turned it back on. So anyways, um, if Microsoft doesn't do this quickly, they're going to fall behind at a very quick rate, right? Amazon already has their product out with this thing has tons of skills. Like it's all the lights you see in here 
are actually hooked up to it. Let's see if this will work. Alexa, turn off the studio lights. Okay. See, I have my whole office is wired up through this Alexa. I'll turn on the studio lights. Alexa, turn on the studio lights. Okay. And so the whole office is wired up through this thing. And if Microsoft doesn't get on this quickly, um, they're going to fall behind because you need the, again, it's the, it's the ecosystem of this stuff that it works with Spotify. It works with my nest. It works with all these, uh, plugs that I have and Microsoft needs that integration for their home automation tool Cortana to work. And so Google is already out of the gate. Granted, again, they're playing catch up to Amazon because Amazon, uh, led the market. But if Microsoft doesn't get out the gate soon, they're going to be in the exact same position they are with Windows Phone, where they have a good product, but no third-party ecosystem. And mm, it's Microsoft. You're, you're driving me nuts with this stuff. So, ah, Microsoft, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I'm, I'm worried that they're going to eventually do this, and then they're going to be late, and then it's just going to flop, much like Windows Phone has, because... Because they're, they're, they're too late. They're either too early or they're way too late. And Microsoft, you're missing the point. I'm really disappointed this hasn't come about. My only, my next hope is that this spring it'll show up with potentially the Surface Book 2 and Pro 5. I, I just hope that they bring one. So until then, we're kind of in this limbo point. I thought about building one. I know I talked about this before, but it's not really possible because too many of the Cortana interactions require you to touch a screen or touch a button to that impact. So... I worry about the future of Cortana if they don't build this cube, if they don't build a product that directly connects to the consumer and make it at a value price proposition. I, I do worry about Cortana. So uh, speaking of Alexa, anyways, uh, it got a new skill this week. I don't use AT&T, but again, this just kind of shows where it's headed, that if you use AT&T with an Amazon Echo, you can now send text messages. So you can say, hey, Alexa, um, send, text messages, te send a text message to my wife and it will be done. So anyways, 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 um, getting kind of into the enterprise stuff. Cause I know, because there was actually a big conference this week. It was Microsoft held its connect conference in New York city. As I kind of told you guys many times, I didn't go, uh, I just wasn't going to go too many trips. I'm going to London next Sunday, a week from Sunday. And so too much travel, um, not enough time with the kid, especially cause the London trips for a week. So I, yeah. Uh, da, 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 what was I going to say? So Azure N series are now generally available starting December 1st. So if that makes sense to you, that's great. What those are, those are the virtual machines in Azure that are powered by NVIDIA GPUs. Uh, for certain groups, that's a, a huge win because uh, GPUs have a narrower focus than obviously a general compute uh, virtual machine. But for those use cases, uh, GPUs are exceptional. So those will now be generally available December 1st. And also announced this week, Microsoft at their Connect Studio announced Visual Studio 2017, or what many of us kind of think of as Visual Studio 2015. This is uh, the next version of Visual Studio. There's an RC1 candidate. RC stands for Release Candidate. Uh, is now available. SQL Server vNext for Windows and Linux is also available. So other other things about that, if you were using SQL Server on Linux, or wanted to, I should say, you can now do so. Pre previously, it was in a private beta with Microsoft, but now they're opening up SQL Server on Linux is now publicly available um, to those who want to try it out. You can go grab those bits. And what's coming next in SQL Server, I don't, can't remember everything on top of my head, but I know that there's more integration with R. So R is a statistical programming uh, language slash modeling tool, and there's going to be more machine learning with that, and that is coming with, yeah, so, uh, other things this week, Microsoft also broke their own embargo, embargo screwed up, whatever, uh, visual studio is coming to the Mac, although don't get caught up in the name it's visual studio, but what it really is is Xamarin studio underneath, but the few new, uh, components added in, but they're calling it visual studio for Mac likely to have that branding the same across everything. So other things that happened in the enterprise world this week, actually, and I always follow this stuff very closely, Amazon cut their cloud cost for EC2 by up to 25%. The 25% cut was in Asia. In the US, it was around 10%. But what's interesting about this is Microsoft and um, Amazon typically like a tit for tat. So now that Amazon has cut prices again, I do, I do wonder if Microsoft is going to do the same. They have been following uh, this stuff back and forth and typically... 
Microsoft isn't far behind once Amazon makes a price cut. Uh, as noted in Amazon's press release, this was the 53rd by their count price cut of uh, their cloud service. So, ooh, that is kind of the headline news, folks. Um, we're going to get into the reader questions, which are always fun. Let me refresh the page. There's quite a few of them this week. All right. So, uh, Isla, as he recommended I call him in the, the comments or in the forums. And, and for those who are curious, uh, every week in throt.com, T H U R R O T T dot com forward slash forums, I always put up a thread and it'll say, uh, like questions for this week's podcast. And it's always the date. So this week's thread was questions for podcast, uh, on 1118. And so he writes, if you read hockey apps and hockey apps is a, an acquisition Microsoft had where they bought a, a uh, it's called Hockey App, and allows you to easily test mobile apps with uh, private beta. It says they're they're headlining the new Visual Studio Mobile Center as well, which makes me think that Mobile Center is a descendant of Hockey App itself. Can you say if this is true? Also, if you read their blog post in detail, you can probably see you won't see any mentions of Universal Apps, though. Th- uh, though the product, the product, uh, product introduction that the blog post links to does mention support for UWP and Apache Cordova potentially. Do you think Mobile Center and uh, will actually support UWP? If so, when? So I do think it will support UWP. I will get very concerned about UWP's future if Microsoft stops supporting it in all of their products. So do I think it will support UWP? Most definitely. If this is just a rebranding of Hockey App, that's the that's kind of the holdup here. Is that really Microsoft has just been doing that? So they've been rebranding stuff as we just talked about with Visual Studio for Mac. So will it be coming? Yes. Mobile Center, I think, is an aggregation and kind of just cleaning up of all their products that they bought to get everything into one center. So uh, X Chaser asks, when will Groove lower the membership price to compete with other music services? $9.99 per month is high and no family plan. They should make a one. They should make a one Prime like Amazon Prime. Oh, one Prime. I see. Like one from one Microsoft. Ninety nine dollars for Xbox Gold, Groove TV, movies, and then we're talking. I actually think that the one price for every service is actually a a great idea. Every once in a while, they'll put up this bundle stuff uh, where they'll give you some Skype credits. Um, Xbox Live Gold, potentially Office 365 tied in there. Um, Microsoft really needs to figure this out because Groove to me is very interesting. And it's not a bad service, but it almost just feels like this unloved child. Microsoft's like, yeah, we have a music streaming service called Groove and it's there and we update it and we keep adding things, but you don't see them promoting it like you see Spotify and even Amazon. So the $9.99 price point, I don't know if I necessarily agree that it's high. Uh, That's what I pay for Spotify. So I guess potentially it's high because uh, Groove doesn't have as many features as Spotify. Maybe that's the reasoning. But they do not have a family plan. This week, everybody has, every other streaming service has a family plan but Groove. And so that is definitely a weak point of that music streaming service. I do wish that they would offer a, a one prime package because I obviously do Office 365. I have Xbox Live Gold. Um, I have $14.05 left in Skype credits. And so bundling all that stuff together uh, would help. And and to be fair, Groove has gotten a lot better lately. So Microsoft is investing. It's just kind of unclear where they're taking the product and what they're going to do. So uh, Merlin asks, have you tried using a Windows 10 mobile device hooked up to a big screen and Xbox controller as as a Microsoft streaming device? I've never actually uh, tried an Xbox controller with... A Windows Phone in Continuum. Um, I, I don't. So I understand what you're trying to get at. This could be a a workaround for a Microsoft streaming solution. Here's here's the thing. Uh, that is that's a really dirty route. Let's just pretend it all works. Let's pretend you can put it up there and you get your Xbox controller working, and it it it's not a good solution because the interface is built for keyboard and mouse. Um, you would need a UI overlay to make this actually work. And so, no, I haven't actually tried it. I, that would be, I'm going to sound excessively lazy. That'd be too much work to get what I need. Really. All I need is a way to get streaming video onto a TV, uh, a nice interface. Like for example, last night I watched the grand tour. I'm not going to spoil anything because I know some people have not watched it, but the grand tour is, if you're familiar with top gear, Jeremy Clarkson, Richard Hammond, and James May, this is their new show. Um, it's on Amazon and I used my Xbox one to fire up, uh, the the UI, what am I thinking here? And then I downloaded the Amazon Prime Video app and it worked great. 
It, that worked fantastic. Do I, do you need a full Xbox to be able to do that? No. Um, but that's, I have an Xbox one hooked up to my TV upstairs and that's what I, that's what I used to watch it and it worked great. So, uh, Adam Jarvis asks, says, hi Brad, uh, regarding the iFixit teardowns of the MacBook Pro with touch bar, making the SSD integrated non-removal in the MacBook Pro with touch bar, is this just another way to sell iCloud backup? Um, any thought on the integration of SSD, making it non-removal, the position of the SanDisk flat chip, da, 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 da. Um, here's the thing. You don't buy a Mac. You don't buy an Apple product because it's easy to repair. Uh, long gone are those days. So if you're buying a Mac, you're not buying it because you think one day, Hey, I'm going to open this up and upgrade the Ram. Uh, I'm going to replace the battery. I'm going to swap it out. You used to be able to do that. Don't get me wrong. I had an older one that I actually put an SSD in. We don't live in that type of a world. You don't buy an iPhone because you think you can repair it. You don't, you don't buy an iMac anymore because you think you can eventually repair it and upgrade it. You buy it because of what it is today. And unfortunately, I don't think they did it to intentionally make it harder. I think they did it to make it slimmer, easier to produce, uh, easier to manufacture. You know, just everything's integrated. And I, I don't think there was any malintent of intentionally making it so people can't repair these things. Because I think that that's a pretty low market um, MacBook Pro repairs like this, at least during warranty. And after that, I don't know, that's just, I'm just going to leave it at, you don't buy a Mac because it's easy to repair. Um, if you want an easy to repair computer, buy a desktop PC that comes in a tower and that's what you get. Even the Surface Book, you cannot repair. Oh, well, I guess technically you could. I mean, technically you can repair anything, but it's not easy. Uh, Space Camel asks, is it too late for Microsoft to release an Xbox streaming device? Absolutely not. So here's the reason why. Xbox has probably one of the best brand names inside of Microsoft. I, I really believe this. I think it's stronger than Surface. I think it's stronger than Windows. And not maybe more universally known, but I think it's a stronger brand. Here's why. Because people who buy Xboxes are fiercely loyal to them, right? They buy Xboxes. They've already sold, uh, we think, over 20 million of these things. And so Xbox is a good brand inside of Microsoft. It's a good brand. And so if they put out an Xbox streaming stick, I think it would resonate well with consumers just because if a if a mom or dad goes to Walmart and they see Roku and they see Xbox streaming stick or whatever Microsoft calls it, Xbox Media Center, wouldn't that be a great name? Although the confusion could potentially be interesting. And anyways, we, we'll go. Moving on. Um, Xbox has a better brand recognition than Roku. And that's probably one of the primary competitors would be Roku and Amazon Fire. Uh, Amazon Fire might be uh, close but definitely better than Roku. I don't think it's too late to release it personally. Uh, ooh, how do you pronounce his name? Hal, Halbadi uh, asks, he says, what about a theoretical Alexa, like hardware talking during one of your podcasts? Um, yeah, I, I hit on that earlier. I want it to be called the Cortana Cube. And um, that's really it. And it says, any, any news about uh, closer Xbox OS and Windows 10 integration? I mean, is there any chance that Scorpio will be in essence a PC? And I hit on this earlier. Actually, I think it was your... Uh, comment that kind of spurred that thought in my brain. Um, I would imagine there's going to be more and more uh, Xbox integration into the PC. I had heard at one point, and I don't know if this is still true, that they were actually looking to try to figure out how to get, not figure out, it should be already done, that inside the Xbox app, you can actually run the Xbox One interface, right? That interface is fantastic for a large screen. And so what would be nice is that if you could use that on other large screens that aren't necessarily connected to uh, an Xbox One. Like I have monitors, like that monitor behind me actually, um, for those of you who can see it, you can see me scrolling. It's actually, I have it mirrored to my, the display I'm looking at. So I'm, those are the form threads, uh, questions that I'm reading. And so it would be nice to be able to just do that. Obviously you couldn't play Xbox One games, at least not yet, unless they do that UWP solution where it's the same thing on everything. Um, it'd be really interesting. I, I don't know. Uh, oh God. Uh, to, to, Tobia Berti, I, I'm butchering names. Anyways, uh, putting aside a moment for the question whether whether Microsoft is or is not ready to go mainstream with Windows 10 Mobile, do you think the public would be ready for such a pro proposition? Uh, he says he knows he would. So Windows 10 Mobile. So you have to separate two things here. Windows 10 Mobile as an OS is fine. There's nothing wrong with the OS. The problem with the OS is that it has. Um, there's no apps. And granted, I know people, every time I comment this, I say the lack of apps um, aren't there, but it, it's, they don't have the lack, the, the same polish. Even if they have, they both have a 
first party Twitter app, but it's not the same. Go use the iOS Twitter app, go use the Android Twitter app, and go use the Windows mobile. It's not the same. It is unfortunately been categorized as a second or third class citizen in the mobile world. So developers put it at an extremely low priority. Um, apps are never first to Windows 10 mobile. So it, it's not a bad OS, it's just not, the ecosystem never arrived. And this is what makes me worried about Cortana, uh, a Cortana Cube is that if, the, if Microsoft doesn't get it out early, then they're going to be in the same situation as the phone where they lack the ecosystem that supports the device. For example, if you buy a Cortana Cube and it can't control your Nest, your garage door, uh, the lights in your studio, it, it, it's significantly, it, it, it's neutered. Microsoft, it, it would be neutered much like the phone is. And so that's why I'm real adamant. Microsoft needs to do this stuff now or just not. If they le release a Cortana Cube in two years, the market has already moved on. Uh, they've already decided that Alexa is the winner. Um, Google Home, we don't know where that will be. Apple always kind of has its own way of doing things. Um, so we'll see what happens with Apple. But yeah, that, that's why I really want them to get it out. Uh, Kudopa, Kudopa asks, uh, since Intel stopped their push into mobile, will AMD ever think about it or Qualcomm or ever grow up to replace Intel as a desktop processor? So what I really recommend, and I'll, I'll go into it here in a second, is go watch What the Tech. Andrew and I talked about this. I brought this up. I said if AMD really wanted to disrupt Intel, AMD has been kind of falling to the wayside. They still make good stuff, don't get me wrong, but Intel is the premium brand. If AMD could figure out how to mail an x86 mobile chip that fits in a phone, they would own that market uh, very quickly because Intel can't do it. And so... I would love for them to be able to get into this. I would love for them to be able to get into this because I'd love to see AMD make a resurgence. And there we go. Um, so I don't know. AMD, if you're listening, do it. But really, the race is... Because the second part of this question is actually very good. It says, or will Qualcomm ever grow up to replace Intel as a desktop processor? So Intel, ARM chips have already won the race to be able to scale up in power while keeping their thermal footprint low. Um, so they've already won that race. So there's another race that's going on and that says, uh, how, how high can ARM chips go? I mean, imagine if ARM chips scale all the way up to be able to compete with Intel chips. I don't think it's unreasonable, especially because there's so many players in the ARM. Basically, you have Intel, which is a juggernaut and a lot of expertise. Don't get me wrong. And, and there are some hard limitations for arm to overcome to get up to that level but if arm can get up into those lower echelons of what intel is now running because they already kicked him out of the low end market intel should be really concerned and it makes me actually wonder if intel is ever just going to buy an arm chip manufacturer like would they ever buy like nvidia um or somebody like that uh, just so that they be became relevant in that space i think it's a really interesting proposition so i don't know uh i don't know arm and intel stuff is is very very interesting to me because for a very long time intel was seen as this untouchable force in the chip manufacturing world then all of a sudden amd kind of came up and uh back in the athlon days amd was kicking some butt so amd was kicking some butt and intel actually i believe they bought a company out of israel and that's kind of how they got ahead and so now intel is back to running the roost and it's always good when the juggernaut gets knocked down a few pegs right and so i would love to see arm really really kind of go into this market and actually take a chance at the desktop microsoft actually could benefit a lot because then they could try to transition some of their legacy stuff over to these arm chips for the desktop and, and don't get me wrong microsoft still compiles windows on arm uh they do it all the time so, I, I don't know. I hope ARM one day is on par with Intel and it gives consumer choice. Consumer choice is always the best thing. I always argue that the consumer choice is the best thing. And there you go. So, uh, I don't know, guys. This has been another crazy week. I just did a podcast with Paul uh, earlier today, actually this morning because he's in Amsterdam. Um, next week, by the way, I will try to, I think I'm going to try to do a show on Wednesday. Uh, I'm not going to do one Friday. Thursday is definitely a holiday. And then the following week, I'm in London. So I, I think the following week actually is what's going to happen. I'm going to have to record it Thursday night to go live Friday because on Friday I'll be flying on a plane and coming home. And so there you go. Uh, I think that's really about it, guys. 
I don't want to drag this on any further. So I hope everybody next week, well, I guess I'll talk to you before then. I hope everybody has a great weekend. It's actually beautiful here today. It's in the mid seventies, although it's supposed to be a terrible weekend in rain, but have a great weekend guys. And I'll catch you all next time.